Hi, everyone. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, it's uh, just a delight for me to be here with you this evening, so thank you for making the trip out today. Uh, I do want to thank Cindy and the uh, steering committee for the invitation to give this address. Uh, I want to thank uh, Debbie and her team here at the library for hosting us and providing us with this venue to uh, talk about these important matters. I want to th thank Dr. Larry Chambers for uh, connecting me with this passionate group of people and, and giving me kind of the opportunity to talk about these things that I do day in and day out in my clinical practice. And uh, I'm also delighted to be standing up here shortly with um, two medical students, so Madeline and Yuki, who have worked very hard to kind of uh, put this presentation together uh, with me. And uh, I have to say, as an educator, it's a joy uh, to see uh, students um, come, come to life uh, around a topic and to see them light up on a topic. And uh, as a geriatrician, to see that happen around the um, older adults and the health and well-being of older adults is especially um, it's thrilling for me. So this is, a, this is a, um, uh, just wonderful to be here. So thank you for having me. I have some objectives for us tonight, but really the overarching theme and what I hope you take away from this is that if, I do, if we do our job effectively in commuting, communicating to you ideas and practices around aging and you implement them in your everyday life, or I spur you on to keep doing the things that you're already doing, maybe, just maybe, I can keep you from coming to see me in my clinic down the road or seeing one of my colleagues in geriatric medicine, okay? So I hope to convey that through these objectives. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the aging landscape in Canada. We'll hopefully establish a paradigm for aging well. I wanna explore some evidence-based interventions for maximizing aging well and mitigating frailty. And then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about what I do and discuss some specialized geriatric services. So the first thing I want you to remember and to take away from this talk is that we need to plan to live longer than we think, but maybe with a limit, okay? I suspect that most of you will live longer than you thought you would live when you were growing up. The life expectancy of Canadians has gone up 20 years since 1920 and continues to rise. Say, for example, you were born in 1946. That would make you 75 years old today. And that would mean that you've lived 10 years longer than the life expectancy the year you were born. And we know from actuarial data that if you're 75 years old today, you're expected to live on average around 12 more years. And that already puts you four years ahead of the current life expectancy of Canadians today. So we have to expect to live longer than we think, unless you have some sort of incurable or life-limiting illness. You've seen these statistics before. Older adults currently make up 18% of the Canadian population. In Niagara, it's closer to 21%. Um, for the first time in 2016, there were more people over the age of 65 in Canada than there were under the age of 14. In the next, by 2050, we expect that number, the percentage of older adults, or adults 65, to go up to 28% or around 30%. And in Niagara, that's expected to be around 35%. And what is the fastest growing subsection of that population? It's centenarians. So... It's anticipated that over the next 50 years, the, the uh, number of centenarians will uh, uh, grow tenfold from around 10,000 to 100,000. But here's the thing. We're living longer than ever. The average life expectancy is increasing. But the maximum lifespan of humans has not increased significantly. Does anyone know who this is? So this is Jeanne Clément. She's a French woman. She died in 1997 at the age of 122 years old. She was the oldest living human we have recorded. While there is some debate about this in the literature, it seems as though from modeling data that it seems extremely unlikely that humans can live longer than around 125 years. And so this is the interesting paradigm we're living in, is that our maximum lifespan might be limited but we're living longer than ever. So show of hands, if you're willing. Do you that, you know, again, I, there is 
firmly rooted in science here, but there, it's just modeling data using physical models. Do you think that our human life expectancy affects? Who thinks that we're pretty much capped out around 125 years? All right, and who would disagree with that opinion? I think that's a fantastic point and a perfect segue into what I was going to say next. That's perfect. It's not just about living longer, but it's about living longer better, right? So let me give you some inspirational and aspirational examples. On the left here, we have Molly Sakaitis. She's one of the oldest Canadians to graduate university with a graduate degree and did so at the age of 88 years old in November of 2021. She worked on her master's degree in theological study for 20 years to achieve that goal. And then on the right, uh, on your right, we have Foja Singh. Foja Singh is the uh, known as the oldest marathon runner in the world. He began running at the age of 89, ran his first marathon at 90, and in 2011, ran the Toronto Waterfront Marathon at the age of 100. He's no longer racing, but at 110 years old, he's still doing quite well. So I want to take a pause here. We'll take two minutes, and I want you to discuss with your neighbors what aging well means to you. And so we'll get your answers at the end, uh, but we'll just take two minutes now to pause and have a discussion, and uh, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Yuki. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So we'll just take up some of your ideas that you think about this question. What does aging well mean to you? Do we have any brave volunteers that want to go first? Anybody? Oh. Yeah, for sure. And did you want to share what you thought? <laughs> yeah, so being able to socialize, being able to give back, and staying in tune with your hobbies and what you like to do. Yeah. Taking care of yourself, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So making that effort to take care of yourself and not let yourself go. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so trying to stay financially secure through old age. Yeah. Yeah. So working on your physical, mental, emotional health. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So what we're saying is that second higher line is what we would want, what we would prefer. Yeah. So we kind of want to maintain that activity level in our lives for as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah, those are all great ideas. Any, anyone else have anything to say? OK. Thank you for your ideas. Um, and I'm glad we could get you guys thinking about what's important to you and um, about your own health, because interestingly enough, what you think about your health matters. So there is a study that researcher in, that researcher, sorry, researchers found that self-reported health and survival are actually correlated. So in other words, the better that you think your health is, the longer that you'll live. So that's represented by this graph here, um, where the x-axis is follow-up time in years, so the time that's elapsed since the beginning of the study, and the y vertical axis is the percentage of the groups that survived. And so the top orange line is the group of people that reported their health to be very good. Uh, and as you can see, a large percentage of that group survived over the 20 years. And uh, the purple line at the bottom uh, is the group that reported their health to be poor. And as you can see, uh, a lower percentage of that group survived. And this result, result still holds true when eliminating for the influence of factors such as biometrics, age, sex, and common diseases like diabetes, osteoporosis, and heart attacks. And um, now I do want to be realistic. So of course, we all want to think positively about our health, but sometimes one's health is just not where they want it to be, and no amount of positive changing can uh, positive thinking can change that, and if there's anything to be taken away from the study, people are very accurate predictors of their own health. And so uh, while we recognize that health may inevitably decline with age, our goal is to live as healthy as possible for as long as possible and to minimize that period of functional dependency and frailty. So that idea of minimizing the period of dependency and frailty is what we call compression of morbidity. And morbidity is just a medical term for um, the state of suffering from a disease or a medical illness. And I'd also like to introduce you to two other terms that you'll see on this slide. So lifespan, which is the number of years um, that you'll live, and health span, which is the number of years you'll live without significant morbidity. And so the top box here represents um, kind of the model of health that we see today commonly. And so we live in a time where chronic disease has surpassed um, acute diseases and aging has kind of become synonymous with uh, diseases like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, and dementia. And so it's conceivable that if you have the onset of a chronic disease when you're 70 years old, that you'll live 20 to 30 years in a state of um, progressive cognitive and functional decline. And so again, that model is predicted, uh, represented by that top box there. The blue box at the end represents that period of disease. And it takes up a significantly larger portion of the lifespan, and the health span is shortened. So we would like to argue that that's an undesirable paradigm for aging, and that we would um, like a paradigm that looks more like the bottom box. And so you might disagree with us, but we propose that a more desirable paradigm is to delay the onset of chronic disease and the progressive cognitive and functional um, decline that follows it as long as possible. And that way, all the morbidity is kind of shrunken to the end of the life. So that's represented there by the um, blue box at the end. It's much shorter. It doesn't take as, as much as the lifespan. And your health span is elongated, which is what we prefer. And so the idea of compressing morbidity um, takes some proactive and meaningful thought and steps in your younger years to make sure that we can kind of push that off as long as possible. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to describe that blue box as frailty. And the term frail is something we hear very often, we probably use very often. Um, and we kind of have an idea of what that looks like, but we don't really talk about what the actual definition is very often. So before I describe it to everybody in a medical sense, I'd like to hear from you. So we'll just take a couple minutes to discuss this question. What does frailty look like to you, or what does it mean to you? Thank you. 
Okay, I'll just give everyone about 15 seconds to wrap up their thoughts and then we'll share with the group. Okay, um, we'll just take time now to share with the group. Again, any brave volunteers want to go first? Physical weakness and mental weakness, yeah. Does anybody want to add on to that? Physical and mental weakness. We can add that on conclusion. Yeah, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, robustness is another one of those kind of big words that we use a lot, but we don't think about um, exactly what it means. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. It's almost like admitting to yourself that you need help. So it's a little bit hard to ask at first and it might progress. Yeah. Yeah, we learn to be independent, yeah. That sounds like a good idea. So for the people online, uh, what does frailty look like to you? Some of the ideas were physical and mental weakness, confusion, no, uh, not able to look after self, susceptibility and vulnerability to things like falls. Uh, they might look frail on the outside. It's the opposite of robustness. Their perception of risk and fear is increased. And you might have a loss of independence. Again, thank you so much for sharing your ideas. That was very insightful. So frailty in the medical definition is a vulnerable state whereby you have trouble returning to normal health after a stressor event, such as a sudden medical illness. And so this uh, figure captures it well. Again, on the vertical y-axis, we have functional abilities. 
and that dotted line through the middle separates independent functional status from dependent functional status. And the green, light, the green line at the top represents someone who is not frail. So you can see that their baseline functional ability is quite a bit higher. And then a minor illness, such as a urinary tract infection, uh, decreases their functional ability by a small amount, but then they're quickly able to return to baseline. Whereas we can compare that to the red, kind of pink line here at the bottom, uh, the baseline functional ability is significantly lower, and a minor illness triggers a disproportionately large decline in functional ability that might take them from an independent status to a dependent status, which is one of the ideas that we talked about. And uh, it takes them much longer to return to uh, previous health, and even then they might never return to baseline. So one of the ways that we assess frailty is through this visual analog scale by Kenneth Rockwood in Dalhousie. Uh, so here we see a spectrum of physical or functional ability, and it goes um, from very fit to very severe frailty as we move right. And features of frailty are uh, muscle loss, weakness, low activity levels, fatigue, slowness, and weight loss. And um, maybe as I walk through this, you can kind of identify yourself on the spectrum, but I'll give the example of someone who is managing well. So they might have medical problems, but they're quite well managed and maybe only occasionally symptomatic, but uh, their functional abilities are a little bit limited and they're not uh, regularly active beyond routine walking. And then if we move down the scale, someone with mild frailty has more evident slowing and needs help with some high order activities like finances, transportation, heavy housework. And typically, um, mild frailty may progress so that um, more activities of daily life are getting challenging. So shopping, um, walking outside alone, meal preparation, and even light housework. So on the very end of the spectrum for very severe frailty, uh, someone living with very severe frailty might be completely dependent on somebody else for self-care, and um, they are not able to recover from minor illnesses, which again is something that we talked about in the last slide. And so you might be wondering um, how many people are actually affected by frailty, and so I'll just give you some statistics. So approximately 5 to 17 percent of older adults are frail, and that increases with age. So if you're between 80 to 84 years old, that percentage increases to 24%, and if you're 85 and up, then that percentage increases to 50%. So the reason why we're so concerned with frailty is because it's associated with a lot of um, undesirable outcomes. So some of them are listed here, functional dependency, prolonged hospitalization, fractures, cognitive impairment, long-term care facility admission, death from cardiovascular disease, and death from all causes. But the good thing is that frailty is preventable and treatable, so Madeline will take on this part of the talk. Yeah, so the, that de definition of frailty would include anyone from the fourth box over. That's the very mild frailty onwards. So this is just a visual analog scale. I would say this is supposed to be used by trained uh, you know, medical practitioners who have some familiarity with some of the assessment tools. So I would say that this is, would be inadequate to use in isolation to assess someone's frailty. I think you would need a more in-depth assessment to draw that conclusion. Yeah. So in the average population, we could roughly say that, or in the population of adults over the age of 65, that about 10% of those individuals would be considered frail. So that would be the fourth box over and on. It seems to increase with age, so that by the time you get to around age 80, it represents around 25%. And then by age 85, it's around 50%. Correct. Correct. And again, that's a very wide range. But until you get to the fourth box, so to speak, you're not considered frail. Yeah. 
right? So again, this was originally designed by Dr. Kenneth Rockwood, who's a geriatrician and um, uh, extensive researcher. He's actually developed a much more complex model uh, called the uh, deficit accumulation model that looks at and kind of it's a it's a rigorous scoring procedure. And so he's extrapolated his work from this in-depth scientific research to create this kind of visual analog scale more as a reference or a guide uh, to help practitioners who are not experts in this area kind of understand visually what that represents. But again, in and of itself, this pictogram would not be adequate to make any sort of diagnosis or even make recommendations around interventions in isolation. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. Yeah. And so are we being overly inclusive? And so I don't, I don't want to alarm anyone. And again, I would say you need to speak to your health practitioner if you have concerns around this. But what we're hoping to address and, and speak to today is what we can do to potentially prevent this or reverse this. Because what we know is that up to about the stage of moderate frailty, a lot of this can be optimized and improved. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm going to be talking exactly about that. So um, now that Yuki has introduced the concept of frailty, I'm going to be talking about how frailty can be uh, prevented and treated. Uh, and it's actually the same um, interventions that are used for both prevention and treatment. Uh, so the single most important intervention you can do to live longer better uh, is to exercise. And it's important to stress that it's never too late to start. Uh, so exercise is the backbone of all frailty prevention, and in fact, all the uh, interventions or recommendations that will be shared later um, have only been shown to be effective when, uh, or in preventing frailty when combined with exercise. So any type of exercise is better than nothing. So if you are part of the 77% of the population that currently does not engage in regular exercise, our first encouragement for you is, is to start. Uh, so stick with any exercise program uh, that works for you. Start low and go slow. Uh, now, if you want to be particular about it, not all exercise is created equal. Uh, so in fact, group exercise has been shown to be the best uh, for preventing and optimizing frailty. Um, and research also seems to indicate that re resistance training, uh, so strength training, uh, and high intensity interval training uh, are better than low intensity uh, cardiovascular activities such as walking. So an example of exercise that Dr. Thrall tells his frail patients is for them to earn their sitting time uh, by doing 20 squats to a, sitting, uh, to a seated position every time they plan on sitting, sitting in a chair. Uh, however, if someone has more experience with exercise resistance bands and weights can be added to that as well. And if you're looking for a resource on this, uh, Osteoporosis Canada uh, has published a document called Too Fit to Fall, uh, which lays out an exercise plan uh, that includes strength, posture, balance, and uh, aerobic exercise. Uh, so one of the reasons exercise is so important uh, is because it can help increase walking speed. And walking speed is important because it can actually be used to uh, predict survival. Uh, so these graphs here are a little confusing, and I'm sure they're also a little small from, for you. Uh, uh, but uh, Essentially, they show here on the vertical axis, uh, if, you can, if you can read it, I know it's small writing, uh, that um, increased gait speed is, in, uh, is associated with increased median survival. Uh, and this was true for both sexes uh, and uh, is uh, especially informative after the age of 75. So in this data, uh, life expectancy um, at the median for age and sex um, occurs at about 0.8. Uh, meters per second. Uh, so gait speeds of one meter per second or higher consistently demonstrated survival uh, that was longer than expected by age and sex alone. So why is gait speed uh, so good at predicting survival? Uh, so walking requires energy, movement, um, movement control and support and places demands on multiple organ systems. 
including the heart, the lungs, the cardiovascular system, the musculoskeletal system, and uh, the nervous systems. So slowing gait may reflect uh, both damaged systems and an increased uh, high energy cost of walking. Uh, so gait speed can then be used as a simple and accessible summary indicator uh, of vitality because it integrates uh, both known and unrecognized disturbances in multiple organ systems. Uh, and maintaining your gait speed is not just dependent on walking more, but as we mentioned earlier, um, it is also dependent on strength um, training and high intensity interval training. Uh, so there is much that we could say about nutrition, but today we wanna focus on two um, key things to focus on. Uh, so these are protein and uh, vitamin D. So protein is the macronutrient uh, that prevents muscle loss, uh, which is something that, uh, that can contribute to frailty. So one uh, study found that a 20% increase in protein intake was associated with a 30% decrease uh, in, uh, in frailty. Uh, so vitamin D, on the other hand, uh, while protein is important for muscles, vitamin D is important for bone health and preventing osteoporosis. Uh, so it is important to ensure adequate vitamin D intake from foods and slash or supplements, uh, since, um, especially in Canada, since 32% of Canadians are vitamin D deficient, uh, and this number only increases in the winter months. Uh, so here we have some excellent sources of protein. Um, now, if we use the example of someone who is 70 kilograms or 154 pounds, uh, and they're aiming for a minimum of 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, um, they would need to eat about 84 grams of protein per day. Uh, so using these foods here to create um, a meal plan for the day, uh, this person would need to eat, for example, uh, for breakfast, two boiled eggs and a cup of milk, some salmon for lunch, um, snack on almonds, um, maybe in the afternoon, hopefully exercise at some point and then drink a protein shake, uh, have lentils for dinner, um, and that would equal about 94 grams of protein. Uh, so as you, we can see here with this example, um, it can be easy to underestimate just how much protein-rich food is needed. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, in all the research on exercise and frailty, group exercise um, appears to be more effective at preventing frailty. Uh, than individual exercise. So obviously, socialization is very important uh, in preventing frailty. Uh, a meta-analysis of 148 studies, so essentially a study studying uh, a lot of studies, um, involving over 400,000 participants, uh, showed that positive social relationships uh, were associated with a 50% increase in survival. Uh, and in fact, the new language in the geriatrics world is that social isolation is the new smoking. So in fact, one study compared the risk of death from social isolation uh, to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. So while socialization has been shown to prevent frailty, the benefits of cognitive training are a little harder to pin down. Uh, practically speaking though, uh, the best type of cognitive training is lifelong learning. Uh, so it is encouraged to keep learning new things. Uh, frailty is also associated with increasing medication use, uh, and increasing medication use, particularly uh, seven or more medications, uh, is associated with increasing the risk of frailty. Um, unfortunately, though, frail individuals tend to be excluded from most medical research studies. Uh, so the effects of frail, um, sorry, the effects of medications on frail individuals are less known, uh, but we do know that the more frail you are, the more likely uh, you are to experience an adverse drug effect um, of a medication. Uh, therefore, it's important to have periodic conversations with your family physician about the appropriateness of your medications, especially if you are experiencing significant uh, cognitive or functional changes. So that's actually a picture I took of one of my patient's uh, medication packages in my clinic. Um, has anyone heard of the blue zones before? Yeah. So the blue zones are areas of the world that have the most centenarians 
with the least amount of cognitive decline. What we're accustomed to in the medical sciences are the you know, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials. So this isn't quite that sort of research. This is more kind of anthropological research. Um, but you know, I, I, there's a lot to be gleaned from this sort of um, evaluation in terms of what it means to live a healthy lifestyle. So the Blue Zone research has established nine themes that have been found amongst these various communities. So uh, our, our last kind of group discussion question during this portion of the evening is, what do you think the most common themes were uh, amongst these various blue zones? So we'll take two minutes to discuss, and then we'll, we'll uh, recruit your answers here in just a moment. All right, so I'll stop you there. Um, anyone to offer some suggestions as to what they, the common themes are amongst the blue zones that we found? Exercise? Fantastic, exercise. Diet, yeah. Anyone want to offer anything perhaps maybe more specific on the diet front? Mediterranean diet. Okay. Socialization. So good weather, we heard. We heard stress reduction, positive attitude. A get up and go attitude. That's right. So the environment, weather, geography. Yes. Extended families, good support systems. A sense of community and being embedded, embedded in culture and the environment. And you're a contributing part of that culture and community. Right. So small cities. Drinking wine. I'll, I'll let you know in just a sec. <laughs> So these are fantastic. Why don't I pull them up for you here? I'm not, I'll read them out and we'll walk through them. So the top at the top is move naturally. And so the idea there is that you're engaging continuous or constant moderate level act of activity because of your environment. So you don't get in the car to drive somewhere you walk, right? Or, you know, you have to, to, to get around your property, you have to walk or to do things, you, you know, so you're constantly moving. The next is you have clear purpose, okay? So a meaningful life. Next is downshift, so there's time taken to de-stress or minimize stress in your life. The 80% rule was a theme that showed that most of these cultures only ate till they were about 80% full. Okay, so there's this idea of restricting calories. Uh, another aspect of their diet, and the Mediterranean diet again would be, you know, one, one of these kind of uh, more formidable diets that there's good scientific research behind. They would describe it in the blue zones as plant slant. And so some of this looked like seasonal vegetarianism, but generally eating a diet that was rich in leg legumes and things of that nature. There's this uh, eating till you're 80% full. Yeah. Uh, wine at five. So wine came up. And so, again, there's this idea of combining, you know, minimal to moderate alcohol intake with the socialization piece. And so it's not something you do 
you know, on your own. It's something that's uh, embedded into the fabric of the community and the social circles. Having the right tribe, so that's a sense of community, which came up. Loved ones first, so that's that notion of extended families and being integrated into your family. A lot of these communities had a sense of belonging, so most often that was some sort of faith community. And, uh, and those are the nine blue zone themes. Uh, I want to pick up, uh, of the, there's many things I think the Blue Zones got right in this discussion, but there's one I want to pick up on and come back to because there's even further scientific evidence to show that purpose is especially important in longevity, and that's one thing we haven't talked about just yet. And so um, the health uh, and retirement study in the United States of adults over the age of 50 years demonstrated that a stronger life purpose was associated with decreased mortality. There's some suggestion that it may having a meaningful purpose may even add up to seven years to your life expectancy. At the very least, we can conclude having a purpose or a meaning in your life uh, has positive health benefits. So find your why. So here's a quick summary of the ground we've covered so far. So think positively about your health. Find your purpose. Exercise, exercise, exercise with others. Focus on protein intake and vitamin D. Keep your mind engaged through lifelong learning and talk to your doctor about potentially inappropriate medications. Now, uh, we had a very, we had a really, really good questions about this scale earlier. And again, this is a, a, an oversimplification and I, I apologize for some of kind of the, um, minimizing the complexity of this a little bit. But, you know, as I said, there's a lot that we can do to mitigate, prevent and optimize frailty. And then there are some times, despite our very best efforts, where we, there's not much we can do and that frailty is inevitable. And so, you know, what do you do when you become frail? Where do you turn? What do you do if one of your loved ones becomes frail? And so I just want to touch very quickly on a little bit about what I do. And so I practice uh, in medicine in, in an area called specialized geriatric services. So I'm within the realm of geriatric medicine but I work collaboratively with geriatric psychiatrists in care of the elderly physicians who are family physicians who have additional training in the care of older adults. When I say geriatric medicine, really what I mean is that we treat frailty. And we look at it through the lenses of five Ms. And those five Ms are mind. So we think about things like depression, and dementia, and delirium. We think about mobility, so maintaining functional independency mobility and exercise, preventing falls. Medications, and again, that's optimizing medications, stopping the wrong ones, starting the right ones, adjusting doses for aging. We filter that through the lens of multi-complexity, and then we try to put it in hierarchical order related to what matters most. So we're always trying to create goal and value aligned care plans. I work in an organization called Niagara Health, which is the largest health system in the region. And what we know about care at Niagara Health is that two thirds of our patient days in our institution uh, are spent by adults over the age of 65. And so we can't see every older adult that comes in. We're a small but mighty team. So a lot of what we do is consultation, both in the hospital and in the clinic uh, to support this care. So I work in what's called the geriatric assessment program that's based primarily out of Niagara Falls, but we see patients at all five hospitals in Niagara Health. There's two primary geriatricians, um, but we're supported by other geriatricians who usually come down about once a month because of our volumes. I work with five dedicated, passionate case managers who work both in the hospital and outside the hospital and the clinic. Um, and a, in addition to our hospital consultation and clinic, we do have a rapid assessment clinic to see people more urgently. As an organization, um, the care of older persons has been targeted as a, you know, uh, uh, an area of focus on the strategic plan, and I've seen it firsthand that our administration is highly committed to this work. Um, and so we have a vision, especially with the new South Site build, to roll out a plan and a strategy for the care of older persons for the foreseeable future in the Niagara region. Um, and our team and, and many others, including our director and manager and uh, other specialized geriatric services, are working tirelessly to build capacity and to start uh, implementing evidence-based models of care to better serve this population in the region. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not a self-referral program. You need to be referred through any other health practitioner, either uh, uh, mainly through your family physician, but other specialists can refer or a nurse practitioner could refer to the program.
I would say it's pretty heterogeneous. A lot of what we do kind of comes down to what we would call geriatric syndromes. And so oftentimes, you know, while it's not all that we do, a lot of what we do is cognitive impairment and dementia. And that usually is the starting point. Because I would say that frailty as a concept is kind of underappreciated and underrecognized by health practitioners. But I, I would filter, I would say what we do is frailty. But again, I would say dementia or cognitive impairment ends up often being the front door. I would say other um, ways that people would come to our program would be uh, mental health issues, complex medication issues, complex medical issues, recurrent falls, th those sorts of things. Well, so one of the questions I have for a breakout discussion for a little bit later is I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear your answers to those questions because I think for so long as geriatric, geriatricians, we've been trying to find the tip of the spear of frailty and focusing our efforts there. But as you can see, there's a lot of work that needs to be done upstream. And um, you know, we don't want to be reactive, we want to be proactive. So I, I would say it's a both and, but I think we've often felt for many years that our value has often been at some of the moderate to more advanced stages of frailty. At least that's how the practice has shaped up so far. Absolutely, and what that requires is a great partnerships with our primary care colleagues because they're the, they're often the, the front door for these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm mindful now of the fact that we're on recording and um, our audience online is not hearing the questions, but the most recent comment was around some of the similarities to palliative care when it was starting out and kind of getting established as a specialty and how patients were often referred only in the later stages of palliative care. And what we've come to learn is that the earlier you start palliative care, the longer people live, in fact, with better quality of life. And I, I think there are many parallels to that in geriatric medicine. Please. Yeah, so I haven't spoken to these figures on, on the right. So let me, let me um, bring you up to speed on those. So as I said, we work in a, in a collaborative, supportive organization, but there are still challenges. Um, we receive roughly 300 referrals per month. Our non-urgent clinic wait times at, at this time are nine months. And so we cannot see people fast enough, and the referrals are coming in at a faster rate than we can keep up with. Based on the way the population is growing in this region, it's anticipated that we would need probably another nine geriatricians in the area to meet the demand. At the moment, there are probably three full-time geriatricians in all of the Niagara region, and there's probably four or five geriatricians who support geriat specialized geriatric services uh, who visit from other areas. If we're looking at the broader region, which would include Brantford, Hamilton, um, Burlington, there's probably a need of around 30 geriatricians for that whole region to support uh, this sort of care. Um, we're only graduating 10 geriatricians per year, roughly, in Ontario. So um, we can't keep up. Please. It is. So they're researchers in aging, gerontologists, yeah. right so for our online audience the question was uh, the first uh, the first our audience member heard of the discussion around geriatrics was around you know 60s or 70s and the que the question was around you know is this a relatively young specialty and the answer to that is in fact yes um, we can I can draw a straight line to some of the you know, uh, grandfathers and grandmothers of geriatric medicine in this area, uh, and many of them are still alive. Dr. Ronald Bain just recently passed away, who's Professor Emeritus, who is one of the foremost kind of leaders in geri geriatric medicine in this area and at McMaster University, and he, he just passed away last year. 
Um, and you know, there's people like Chris Patterson who are still practicing, who are some of the, some of the earliest geriatricians uh, at McMaster. So very much the emergence of geriatric medicine comes about as a result of the fact that we are now living longer than ever. And so there are unique um, challenges that come with aging and compl uh, medical complexity. So you're, you're absolutely on the right track there. To be careful how I answer that question. Um, there's no pill for geriatric syndromes. And so the, our programs are based on skilled practitioners employing their, employing comprehensive assessments and personalized hands-on care plans. People are expensive uh, in healthcare. Uh, it's much cheaper to prescribe a medication. And so um, it's, it's hard to deliver the types of models of care that we need. And, uh, I would hope, uh, and again, this is, you know, I would love to see just that we, I would hope that we could continue to do more, uh, to support these sorts of efforts. And I know that uh, we have great advocates within the administration at our organization to move these notions forward. Um, if you look at things, uh, things at a provincial level, I, you know, I think we need, we need more. We need more funding. And, and, you know, a lot of, I would almost argue that adult medicine is geriatric medicine. And so, you know, part of the reason why I'm an educator as well as a geriatrician is because I'd love to see the bar raised across all health disciplines to empower, you know, physicians especially, which is my domain, but all interprofessional health members do a better job of caring for older adults. And so, you know, that, that is something I think we need to uh, devote more attention to upstream at the education level as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our prevention measures tend to be outside typical medicine recommendations. And by that I mean having group exercise classes is not always thought of as within the health system. Encouraging protein intake and socialization are not really what you go to see your doctor for. These are programs that ideally would emerge from within the community. So I do think we all need to be working collaboratively and thoughtfully about how we approach these sorts of things at every level. Um, both from within and without that, uh, and outside the health system. I completely agree. 
Yes, I don't know that literature off the top of my head. I, I would say it, it's it must be, there must be. There's t 10 in Ontario every year. Yeah, yeah, maybe 17 to 20 in, in the whole country every year. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. I'm wondering if we should transition into more of a discussion and perhaps end the recording. Um, does that sound okay? And then we could ha more have an informal uh, discussion off the recording. How does that sound? Yeah.